look at these three pairs of jeans. On the tags, they all say that they're the same size, but when I hold up a measuring tape, they say something different. What in the sisterhood of traveling pants is going on here? Well, it turns out that pants are a lot like icebergs. You actually have no idea how big they really are. But how did it get this way, and how do we change it? That is a journey you will not believe. It is a crazy ride that led us to the sizing system that we have today. And the cruel reality is, history is about to repeat itself. Hello Internet! Welcome to Style Theory, the one-size-fits-all channel for anyone looking to solve the mysteries of fashion. Now, as a guy, I always knew that women's sizing worked a lot differently than men's. Guy's sizing typically goes from boys to men, insert 90s album cover here, with a few of us venturing out into the taller or plus sizes. And the idea is pretty darn simple. You get your waist measurement, you get your inseam measurement, and you're good to go. Women, on the other hand, oh jeez, you got yourself girls, juniors, women's tall, petite, plus, Size zero? Size double zero? What is going on here? Who needs this many categories? And it doesn't even stop there. When I told the women of Team Theorist that I wanted to talk about sizing, well, first off, they just laughed in my face, but the second reaction was to tell war stories about shopping for pants, trying on pair after pair and store after store because they never knew what size was gonna be accurate to their body, or even what accurate meant across various establishments. Sometimes even within the same store, they were needing to buy different sizes. Like, say you're jean shopping for someone with a 29-inch waist at a department store. That means you're looking at a size 8 from Ralph Lauren, a size 10 from Tommy Hilfiger, a size 6 from NYDJ, which is not your daughter's jeans, that's a new one that I learned, or a size 32 from True Religion. Out of that list, I would like to call your attention to two key factors. One, none of those numbers are the same, even though we're still talking about the same size, and two, none of them are 29! Not one of them are the actual number of the measurement that we took, and that's not even touching on this massive gap of what counts as a small, medium, or large. You can be an extra small in one brand and a medium in another. Why? What is going on? Can we come back from this shopping nightmare to some kind of civilized sizing system? Well, it turns out that the problem of clothing sizes is one of those iceberg issues. We see the tiny bit at the top, which is all the weird mismatched sizes that are happening at the stores, but under the surface, there's a lot more to see. From government agencies to wartime rationing. Yeah, really. So hold on to your pants, friends. We're heading under the surface to see just how big the iceberg gets. First, let's just get one thing straight. When it comes to standardization of sizing in the women's clothing section, the standard is non-existent. There is nothing there at all. Retailers don't have to answer to anyone when it comes to setting up their sizing. So in general, you find two major systems at work here. Alpha sizes that uses small, medium, and large, and numerical sizing which uses even numbers for women's and odd numbers for juniors. And l let me just stop right there again. Why does women's fashion have this extra category? Nowadays, junior sizes are considered to be for or, quote, developing bodies, with styles that cater to shorter torsos, smaller busts, and slimmer hips. Now, I might not be the target audience for that sort of branding, but I can say it feels confusing that it gets its own category when men's clothing just works that into the standards. Well, it turns out that juniors wasn't originally intended to be that at all. In fact, it functioned closer to a petite or smaller sizing. Junior, or junior miss as it was called back in the day, was made to be an alternative for more petite women. That's it, it was just smaller sizes. Which honestly explains why I always find Steph shopping in the junior section. They offer a better fit for someone small, and they're actually cheaper to boot. But even then, she's still taking at least five pairs of the same pants to the dressing room to try and find the pair that fits her. So what is the problem in this? Welcome to the next level of this iceberg, the wild world of vanity sizing. And if that sounds like I'm calling shoppers vain, let me get one thing straight. I'm not, but you know who is, the big corporations behind all your favorite clothing brands. When it comes to shopping, people aren't just shopping with an eye out for the best bargain, they're looking to feel good in their clothes. And brands have taken that idea and ran with with it to an extreme. How? Well, vanity sizing is basically size inflation, or I guess size deflation, where someone with a bust of 32 inches would wear a size 14 in the 1930s, a 6 in the 1960s, and in 2011, that same person would now be buying a size 0. Yep, you heard me, 0, as in the number that means literally nothing. Yep, makes a whole lot of sense. The most famous example of this in history is Marilyn Monroe, who was considered to be a size 12 back in the 1960s, and would now be considered a size 4 to 6 in 2023. Brands basically learned that if they marketed their sizes to appeal to the shopper's quote, desired size, rather than a specific measurement, then they were able to sell more items and that shopper was more likely to come back and buy more. And again, without any sort of agreed upon standardization in the industry, those desired sizes will vary from store to store. What that means is that the waistband of a pair of size 6 women's jeans can vary as much as 6 inches from one brand to the next. That is an insane level of variability. I'm not a fan of these big corporations using 
using our self-image against us in the name of making more money. So how did we possibly get to this market of no accountability? Well, it turns out that there did indeed used to be someone holding the reins to this crazy sizing circus. The government. And, uh, we all know how great it is when the government sets up rules around women's bodies. People really love that one. That's right, in 1949, Uncle Sam whipped out his measuring tape to help you find the perfect fit for your new pair of jeans in response to one unusual problem. There were too many returns. Back in the days before Amazon and free returns, people were still shopping from the comfort of their own homes, but instead of scrolling on their phones, they were flipping through the pages of catalogs. Uh, a catalog was just a big old book, basically a printed version of your IG feed complete with just as many ads. The more things change, the more they stay the same, am I right? It seems normal for us now, but back then, it was the new frontier for fashion. In this new world of at-home shopping, companies were starting to feel the pain in their wallets. With people no longer needing to go to stores to try things on, they were faced with this brand new task of trying to understand what size to buy for themselves without seeing it or trying it on. And they were getting the answer wrong a lot. Companies couldn't keep up with all the money they were losing from the returns. To fix this, the Mail Order Association of America partnered with the National Bureau of Standards in 1949 to standardize sizing for both men and women to help reduce returns. And in 1958, nearly 10 years later, they finally came up with an answer. The Commercial Standard. A collection of clothing sizes made to cover the widest range of people possible without them needing to alter their clothing at home. And that's an important point, because regardless of what size you bought, most women were still expected to know how to sew and alter their clothes. And the commercial standard did help at first by reducing returns, but then sizes began to change, times began to change, and clothing needed to change along with them. And they did try, releasing an update in the 1970s to try and keep up with the demand for change, but it just didn't last. Now, up to this point, we've been focused on the way that we've tried to fix the sizing problem in women's clothing, but it all had to have started somewhere, right? Theorists, I feel like we're so close to the bottom of this thing, to where the size discrepancy for women all first started. But before before we can get there, it's time for me to follow the commercial standard of YouTube and ask you to hit that subscribe button. You see, we are currently marching our way to that 2 million subscriber milestone, and to do that, I'm gonna need your help. In exchange, you'll get a new exciting episode in your sub box every week. If you think the conspiracy behind women's sizes is crazy, wait until you find out the conspiracy behind your soap. Soap that's not gonna get you clean. Also, last week we figured out how Barbie's mile high heels might actually be giving her superhuman ankle strength. All of that and more, just from one click of the button. It's free, it's easy, and you'll learn a lot along the way. And now let's get back to the deep dark bottom of the clothing iceberg mystery. So you might be wondering, how did men get through all of this mostly unscathed? Well, they actually had one thing working in their favor, war. Yeah, as bleak as it sounds, it's actually true. As far back as the 1800s, global war efforts meant that militaries needed clothing to outfit their soldiers and they needed it fast. Up until then, people mainly relied on tailors and their wives to help mend and alter their clothing to fit. However, those methods didn't translate to the high production rates that were needed by the military. And so, the first ever ready-to-wear outfit was made, not to walk the runway, but to walk the battlefield. And it was made using only one measurement, chest size. While this was certainly a very bare-bones means of sizing, the idea of affordable ready-to-wear clothing eventually made its way to the fashion industry, at least for the men. Women were still stuck spending the big bucks on tailors, stabbing their fingers with needles at home sewing to get themselves the perfect fit. And that, theorists, now leads us to the final layer of this iceberg, to the shadowy figure of women's sizing standards that led us to where we are today. One woman behind it all, Ruth O'Brien. O'Brien was the head of textile and clothing at the U.S. Bureau of Home Economics in 1939, known today as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it was her personal mission to fix sizing for women and children. You see, Ruth, aspiring Glinda that she was, saw men getting standardized sizing and thought, yeah, why not take that idea and bring it to the women's department? Sounds great, right? Finally, someone is here to help fix the problem. Back at the time before Ruth got her hands onto things, sizing was based on age for young girls and bust size for women, meaning that every 15-year-old was supposed to fit a size 15, and every woman was expected to have the same hourglass shape proportional to their bust measurement. Uh, not great. Obviously, it was a system that was operating off of some unfair body assumptions, so Ruth comes in with a plan to fix it all, right? Well, it turns out that while Ruth's ideas were great, the execution left something to be desired. The study started off strong. It took 55 unique measurements from each of its 15,000 participants, from the slope of their shoulders to the, quote, girth of the abdominal extension but the devil is really in the details. While the sampling size certainly seemed large, and you're talking about finding a universal standard, 15,000 people, it's a very small sample size considering the US population in 1939 was about 130 million, but that was actually the least of their problems. The more we look into the study, the more we see cracks in its foundation. Due to older women's reluctance to participate in a study like this, O'Brien's data skewed younger. This meant that on average, sizes would lean towards more youthful body types, much like we talked about with the junior sizing earlier. Likewise, the study also leaned toward women from families making
making less than $2,000 annually. However, there is one major red flag that has to be addressed, race. Oh, the yikes on this one keep coming. According to the study, quote, when it was found necessary, for the sake of good feeling within a group, to measure a few women of other than the Caucasian race, this fact was entered under remarks and the schedule later discarded. So basically, they threw away a huge chunk of data from anyone who wasn't Caucasian. And if that wasn't bad enough, the hits just keep on coming. Ruth also wrote off an additional third of the data for, I quote, gross errors, where the supervisor of the measurement basically threw out any numbers that they didn't believe. Any numbers that they were like, oh, a human body couldn't look like that, and they were just scrapped entirely. An entire third of the data was lost for all of those reasons. So really, might be skewing the data a bit as far as what the average size of an American woman looks like, huh? So what then did she propose off of all this thoughtfully collected data? Glad you asked their friends because she recommended that manufacturers use her data to create roughly 27 different sizes of dresses for consumers. Does that number sound familiar? Because it should. Looking at her modern sizing, you see that the same idea is still in practice to this very day. And that right there, that is the cherry on top of this depression Sunday. Because the commercial standard, you know, that thing that we talked about earlier that tried to solve the sizing problem but ended up making it worse and paving the way for the size inflation we have today? Yeah, that thing, it drew a huge portion of its data from Ruth. Problems and all. So the entire foundation of how we think about women's sizing today is based on one woman's highly inaccurate, highly biased, non-inclusive data set of what the American woman should look like. That, my friends, is the conspiracy behind women's clothing sizes. But I can't just leave the episode there because if there's one thing that you should take away from all of this is that there is still hope for some kind of a universal or at least an easier sizing system in the future. Remember how I said that the commercial standard came about because companies were feeling the hurt when it came to returns and lost sales? Well now, in the age of online shopping and easier returns, you're seeing the exact same problem creeping up again. About 30 to 40% of clothing bought online is actually returned. It is a huge margin that is killing merchandisers in restocking and reimbursement fees, putting us once again on the edge of a whole new evolution in how we think about clothing sizes. While the technology is still in its early development stages, several tech companies are racing to crack the code of developing AI systems that can accurately measure us through our phone cameras. We could soon be saying bye-bye to changing rooms altogether, provided we're all comfortable giving Skynet an entire scan of our body. I guess everything in life is a trade-off. But hey, that's just a theory. A style theory. Keep looking sharp. And if you love conspiracies, you'll love our episode about what made women's pockets so ridiculously small. That one is the box on the right. Or if you want to learn what's actually going on inside of those jeans once you manage to buy them, click the box on the left to find out what is growing on your legs, because spoiler alert, your soap is failing you. Welcome to Style Theory, my friends, making you question all your life decisions. As always, I will see you next week.